morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to wish you all a very happy new year in advance. On behalf of Adelaide Oncology, I would like to welcome guest speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Akansha Garg, and discussants, Dr. Amit Khurana, Dr. Anu, Dr. Anushri, Dr. Ashraful, Dr. Avitri, Dr. Chandrasekhar, Dr. S.K. Sathiya, Dr. Deep Gala, Dr. Fahima, Dr. Hita, Dr. Jaswanthini, Dr. Mona, Dr. Naved, Dr. Rijwan, Dr. Sanjeev, Dr. Seema, Dr. Shalendra, and Dr. V. Mon. So before we proceed, I would like to take just a couple of minutes to tell you the recent developments in Adelaide Oncology. So now we have entered into the regulated market. So now Adelaide is available in entire Latin America, CIS countries, Asia, and Africa. And also we have triggered audit for EU GMP. And I hope by 2025-26, we will be available in more than 75 countries globally. We have a very rich portfolio in a hemato-oncology segment, and we are among the very few companies who manufacture products like Plerixa 4, Pagal Aspergenase, Ajacidin Oral, and Carfilzumab. We have already introduced in the market Calonib, that is Nidotinib 150 and 200 mg capsules. And I'm very glad to announce the first time launch in Asia, that is Kexfila OS Magistral Acetate Suspension. No company in Asia and, and Europe is having this product. So I'm very glad to announce uh, the launch of Kexfila OS. Also, we are launching now fourth, that is first generic of ferric carboxymaltose. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Amit Khurana, sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashutosh Shukla. You need to stop sharing your screen first. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Ashutosh Shukla. So very, very good evening to all of you and good morning and good afternoon to all others who are joining from rest part of the world. Today, our guest speaker for the day is Dr. Akanksha Garg from Ahmedabad. And she's going to lecture us on plastic plasma cytodendritic cell neoplasm management and therapeutic advances. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group, supported by Adelaide Oncology and managed by Perfect Square. I thank Mr. Ashutosh Shukla and the team from Adelaide Mr. Yash, Mr. Kalpesh, and the team Perfect Square, Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, our guest speaker for the day, Dr. Akang Shagar from Ahmedabad, all of our discussions were themselves very eminent hematologists and medical oncologists, and you participants were spending your Saturday evening, morning, and afternoon. Tomorrow, that is Sunday, 31st of December 2023, from 11.30 a.m. IST onwards, we have a webinar on advances in management of myelodysplastic syndrome, by our own guest speaker, Dr. Ami Patel from Blood and Cancer Institute, Surat. Let me introduce our discussions for the day and we have a galaxy of them here displayed in alphabetical order. To start with, we have Dr. Anup P from Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. Dr. Anushu Chaturvedi from Advanced Cancer Care, Sundarpur, Varanasi. Dr. Ashraful Haq Chaudhary from Dhaka Medical College Hospital, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. Avriti Baveja from Himalayan Institute of Medical Sciences, Hims, Dehradun. Dr. Chandrasekhar Bandi from Mahatma Gandhi Cancer Hospital and Research Center and Institute Visag. Dr. D.S.K. Sahitya from Medicover Hospitals Visag. Dr. Deep Gala from SGPJ Lucknow. Dr. Fahima Hassan from United Institute of Medical Sciences Prayagraj. Dr. Hita Diljit from Gobernment Medical College Kozikode, Kerala. Dr. A.R. Jaswindini from Yashoda Super Specialty Hospitals Hyderabad. Dr. Mona Vijayaran from SGPJ Lucknow, Dr. Navid Tamboli from Mumbai, Dr. Rizwan Akhtar from SGPJ Lucknow, Dr. Sanjeev from SGPJ Lucknow, Dr. Seema Bhatwadekar from Bailal Amin General Hospital and Sterling Cancer Center, Vadodara, Dr. Shailendra Prasad Varma from King's George Medical University, Lucknow, Dr. Yi Mon Tan from North Akkalappa General and Teaching Hospital, Kyakot, Myanmar. Now it's the time to introduce our guest speaker for the day, Dr. Akang Shagrak from Ahmedabad. She is a very knowledgeable and very up-to-date hematologist, settled in Gujarat, 
and it's my formal duty to introduce her. She's MD Pediatrics, DNB Pediatrics, and PDCC Hemato Oncology and DM Clinical Hematology. She's a consultant hematologist and BMT physician at Zydus Hospitals and Zydus Cancer Center, Ahmedabad. She's ex assistant professor, consultant hematologist, and BMT physician at Department of Medical Oncology, GCRI, Ahmedabad, from the year 2018 to 2022. She did her MBBS from Molana Azad Medical College from the year 2003 to 2009. MD Pediatrics from Lady Harding Medical College from the year 2019 to 2012. She's PDCC in Hemato Oncology from Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow from the year 2013 to 2014. She did her DM in Clinical Hematology again from the same institute, Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Med Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow from the year 2015 to 2018. She has also done observership in adult stem cell transplant from France in the year December 2018. Again, she did her observership in pediatric stem cell transplant from Germany in January 2020. She has got following membership. She is a member of pediatric hematology oncology chapter SIOP, PHO chapter IAP, ISHBT, ISBMT, ESMO and EHA. She has numerous peer reviewed articles in both international and national journals. Her areas of interest include stem cell transplantation, myeloma, lymphoma, acute myeloid leukemia, and hemoglobinopathies. And today she's with us, lecture is lecturing us on plastic plasma cytodendritic cell neoplasm management and therapeutic advances. Well, thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Akang Shardarg. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for the kind introduction. So at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. M.B. Agarwal and uh, the Mumbai Hematology Group for giving me this opportunity. So today I'll be talking about the uh, management and therapeutic advances in BPDCN. So this is the outline of my talk. I will briefly describe the pathophysiology, the presentation and diagnostic challenges associated with this disease. And then I will discuss about the treatment, both the conventional treatments as well as the novel agents, and also briefly about the role of stem cell transplantation. So as per the WHO definition, BPDCN is a neoplasm which comprises of immature cells having plasma cytoid dendritic cell differentiation, and it has a high frequency of cutaneous and systemic dissemination. To understand this disease, it is actually a very rare but clinically aggressive uh, disease and difficult to diagnose because it mimics a number of other hematologic malignancies. The median overall survival is approximately one to one and a half years, and this malignancy has a male predominance. Also, there is a bimodal age distribution. So patients either present uh, below the age of 20 years and the second peak is seen above 60 years of age. There are four major components in the involvement of the skin, followed by the bone marrow, the CNS, and the lymph nodes. The hallmark of this disease is the overexpression of CD123. And there is a classical triad of expression of CD123, CD4, and CD56. So the mnemonic is think 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is important for the hematopathologists. And there are certain specific markers also, which is the CD303, CD304, and transcription factors TCL1 and TCF4. There are certain molecular mutations also which are associated with this disease, commonly the TET2 and ASXL1, which is seen in more than 50 to 60% of the patients. In 20 to 30% of the patients, this disease is associated with the clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential or the CHIP, as well as MDS and MBN. So this entity was first described in 1994 by Adachi and others, which was a Japanese group, and they found high expression of CD56 in a patient with cutaneous CD4 positive lymphoma. And after this, we know that in the WHO classification, this disease has had multiple names and uh, labels, starting from blastic NK cell lymphoma initially in 2001, to the agranular CD4, CD56 positive hematodermic neoplasm in 2005 and so on. 
So this has actually been an orphan disease till now. But uh, in 2016, it was identified as a unique myeloid neoplasm. And in the recent fifth edition uh, WHO classification, it has been placed under the dendritic cell and histiocytic neoplasms as the BPDCN. So coming on to the pathophysiology, so uh, basically the HSCs, they uh, give rise to the myeloid and the lymphoid progenitors. So the common dendritic precursors arise from the myeloid progenitors and then they differentiate further into the pre-CDCs or the pre-conventional dendritic cells and as well as the plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And it is this fraction of the cells which are myeloid in origin that actually give rise to the BPDCN. So they have uh, got the antigen pre presenting cell function. And also amongst the lymphoid progenitors, some uh, subset of the cells also, uh, uh, the PDCs are formed from them, but these have low APC function. So there is no known genetic or environmental factor which causes the etiolo etiopathogenesis of the BPDCN, but certain myeloid and lymphoid abnormalities are seen with this disease. And these are basically the early hits or the early events which are seen. So commonly we have the epigenetic mutations like the TET2, the ASXL1, the EZH2, which is seen in more than 50% of the cases. And on the lymphoid side, uh, side we have the Icorus family transcription factors, which is the IKZF1 mutations, as well as the ETV6 mutations uh, with the deletion 12P, which are early events. Along with this, there is a host of many other mutations as well, which are associated with the pathogenesis. So this was an interesting paper, which was published in Nature. And uh, here the group had postulated that UV light actually leads to the dendritic cell leukemia transformation. And this happens in the skin. So what happens is that the progenitor cells, which going to later form the BPDCN, they migrate to the skin. And uh, because of the UV light exposure, there is acquisition of uh, mutations, especially the loss of function mutation of the TET2. And then these cells transform into the BPDCN cells and these migrate back into the bone marrow as well as other sites like the lymph nodes and the CNS and cause the disease. So a little word about the TET2 mutations. So uh, they are seen in almost 70% of the patients having BPDCN. And it is the truncating mutations which are associated with the worst outcomes in BPDCN. They are sensitive to the hypomethylating agents and are associated with increased CNS involvement at diagnosis. If we talk about the disease spectrum of the plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm, so there are basically two types. So on the right hand side, you can see that this is the blastic form or the blastic plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm. And on the left side, we have the PDC associated myeloid malignancies. So what this is that it is a, a type of a, a proliferation of the PDCs which have a low grade morphology. So they are actually called as the mature plasma cytoid dendritic cell proliferations, which are associated with myeloid malignancies like CMML and AML. So in these uh, patients, there will be two clones of the PDCs as well as the CMML. And, uh, but the PDC aspect of it will be uh, low in uh, uh, the KI67 index as compared to the BPDCN. Nowadays, uh, recently it has been shown that PDC AML is actually a separate entity from AML, which is intermittent between BPDCN and AML. And it comprises of 5% of cases of AML. And it is scatterized by a flow cytometry profile, which is intermediate between the BPDCN and AML. So what you can see here that we have the BPDCN markers, which is CD123, CD56, and CD4. But these can also be found in the AML cases. And uh, there will be one specific marker of BPDCN, like the CD303. And the AML markers or the linear specific markers for the myeloid malignancies, like CD34, will be positive. And interestingly, 70% of these patients have RUNX1 mutations. They have a worse outcome and increased incidence of skin lesions as compared to the non-PDC AML. And because this is CD123 positive, it is amenable to treatment with CD123 targeting agents like Tagraxofus. Another entity is the BPDCN, which is associated with either prior or concomitant hematologic malignancies. 
So what this concept is that BPDCN can either present with a concomitant myeloid malignancy and even certain cases of ALL can be associated with BPDCN. And this is seen in almost 10 to 20% of the cases, commonly having TET2 mutations. But the concept here is that there is a divergent clonal evolution of the BPDCN as well as the myeloid malignancy from a shared founding clone. So either the patient will present with both the BPDCN also as well as the hematologic malignancy concomitantly, or they would have had a prior history of a hematologic malignancy uh, prior to developing the BPDCN. So coming on to presentation. So the pre presentation is very variable. Majority of the component is the cutaneous uh, component where the presentation can be in the form of papules, large papules, which are violaceous in appearance. Along with that, you know, you can have certain macular uh, appearances. Sometimes these papules and macules can poorly as well. And uh, even uh, in some cases, even mucosal violaceous papules can be seen. So this can be easily confused with the uh, patients uh, of uh, leukemia cutis. So it is very important to, uh, you know, uh, uh, come to an exact diagnosis in these patients. And almost two thirds of the patients will have a skin and systemic involvement. One third can have just skin involvement and very rarely the patients can just present with leukemic presentation. On the right hand side, you can see the bone marrow sample where these uh, abnormal uh, blasts can be seen. And these are the characteristics, uh, you know, the immunoblastic appearance of the BPDCN where there is a, a bluish cytoplasm along with the eccentric uh, nucleus having opened up chromatin. And many of them even have these cytoplasmic vacuoles. And uh, many a times they can be uh, present together and they give a appearance of a string of pearls. So for the diagnosis, what are the important investigations that you need to do? Of course, your clinical examination and systemic evaluation. And many a times these patients can present with lymphadenopathy. So, you know, you need to map out the disease. You might have to do a CT scan or a PET CT to uh, find out uh, the other lymph nodes as well as the extramedullary disease involvement. But most importantly, the bone marrow aspirate and biopsy is extremely uh, essential. And this has to be subjected to the flow cytometric evaluation. The detailed flow cytometry, I will just come to it uh, in a minute. And at baseline, CSF evaluation is also very important. Once you establish a diagnosis of uh, BPDCN, you need to do a baseline uh, CSF evaluation because these patients tend to have very high incidence of uh, uh, CNS involvement. Other tests that should be done but not essential is the cytogenetics and the NGS for myeloid mutation assessment. So here I've just shown that how the CD markers are, you know, uh, common between the BPDCN and the AML as well as ALL. So you, you can see that, you know, the HLA-DR, CD123, 117, 56, all these are uh, can be seen in both the AML and the BPDCN. Similarly, CD4 uh, can be seen in uh, cases of um, uh, the ALL as well as BPDCN. But these four, uh, four markers, they are specific for the uh, BPDCN. And uh, any one of these should be present for the diagnosis. So finally, coming to the diagnostic criteria. So the international uh, consensus classification gives the histologic criteria, which is there. I will not go into the details. But most importantly, the WHO has defined the immunophenotypic criteria. So the expected positive markers are these, CD123 and TCF4. So a combination of these two markers is the most specific to point towards the diagnosis of BPDCN. And uh, along with that, TCL1, CD303 and 304. If CD4 and CD56 is present, then it can further point towards BPDCN. And the expected negative markers are basically your uh, T lineage, B lineage, as well as the myeloid lineage markers, like MPO should be negative, CD34, lysozyme, CD3 and CD14. And uh, here they have given the criteria where the expression of CD123 along with one of the specific PDC markers in addition to CD4 and or CD56 is required. So what I want to highlight is that these four markers, one of them should be present if you want to uh, you know, pinpoint the diagnosis of BPDCM. Now finally coming on to the treatment, so there is basically a concept of giving multi-agent chemotherapy in BPDCN, which uh, can be either an AML-like treatment where you give 7 plus 3 and HIDAC or an ALL-like treatment where hyper CVAD can be given. And some people have even uh, given CHOP and CHIOP-based therapies and myeloma-based therapies in uh, these cases. 
But the most important thing is that there is no clear winner amongst all these uh, types of therapies because uh, this is a very uh, high-grade neoplasm, very aggressive, and ideally you should be giving intensive chemotherapies for these patients. But majority of the patients are actually elderly, so it is not always possible to give that kind of treatment in these patients. But the main role of uh, these uh, uh, therapies is that actually you need to bridge the patient uh, to an allergenic transplant if that is feasible because without a transplant the overall survival is very dismal and uh, the relapse rates are very high so uh, that is extremely important so here in this slide uh, i have just highlighted why uh, lymphoid or the all based treatments are uh, extremely effective in bpdcn and it was based Basically, uh, the MD Anderson group, which has actually propagated a lot of uh, ALL treatments um, in BPDCN. And uh, this is mainly because a lot of patients will show uh, the IKZF1 inactivation. And along with that, TDD positivity can be seen in some cases of BPDCN. And because this has a very high propensity to cause CNS disease, the ALL-like treatments have a lot of CNS-directed therapy, which is not seen with the AML type of therapy. So uh, that can be uh, very effective for these patients. And many of them even have MIC rearrangements. Here you can see that, uh, you know, this uh, case just highlights that, I mean, this was a case where he had these uh, papular lesions and uh, after one week of dexamethasone, the lesions actually disappeared. He had not received any vincristin or donorobicin and the uh, lesions just, uh, uh, you know, they just melted. So um, hyper CVAD also, this is a sort of an intensive uh, ALL treatment. And this data from the MD Anderson group has shown that uh, in a uh, group of 100 patients, 35 had received a hyper CVAD for the BPDCN. And they showed the uh, whooping uh, CR rates of 80% with the median overall survival of over two years. So of course, this is a very good mortality for treatment. What about the consensus on CNS prophylaxis? So almost 22% of the patients would be positive for uh, uh, the uh, CNS at any time during the disease course and 57% can also be asymptomatic at presentation. So uh, many risk factors are also involved, uh, which lead to um, higher uh, propensity for CNS involvement, which includes uh, lower hemoglobin values, higher frequency of TED2 mutations and bone marrow involvement. So it is mandatory to do a diagnostic and therapeutic lumbar puncture, both at the time of uh, BPDC and diagnosis, as well as at the time of relapse. And as per the NCCN guidelines, uh, patients who have uh, got CNS disease, they should get twice weekly CNS directed uh, therapy until the CSF is clear. And once the CSF is clear, then you continue giving weekly IT treatments so at least four doses. And after this, every 15 days for a total of eight doses. And uh, even after that, many groups uh, do um, uh, say that, you know, you should continue with the IT treatment because once you stop the CNS prophylaxis, these patients tend to develop uh, CNS relapses very soon. And um, many of them just uh, uh, say that you can give uh, methotrexate and cytarabine alternating when you are giving the IT therapy. So you don't need to give a combination, but once you give a methotrexate and the second time cytarabine and so on. The patient does not have CNS disease, then at least uh, twice per month uh, IT therapy for a total of eight doses is definitely required. So this was uh, the study done by the French group and the latest results were presented at the uh, ASH 2023 where they have used uh, intensive chemotherapy, which is ALL-like, which includes basically the idarubicin and methotrexate and dexamethasone. And what they uh, found was that patients who could actually tolerate these therapies till the end, they had almost uh, had 100% uh, survival probability. So once you've given the treatment to the patient, how do you assess the response? So because this is an orphan disease, the uh, majority of the response criteria have been borrowed by, uh, you know, other uh, diseases. Like for the cutaneous, you have the M-SWOT evaluation, which is the modified severity weighted assessment tool. This is used uh, commonly for the cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. Uh, for the, um, the leukemic aspect, you can just do CBCs and uh, uh, bone marrow evaluations, and uh, that can be used to see the response. And if the patient has lymph nodes, then a serial CT or a PET CT can be done just to uh, image the uh, other viscera and the extramedullary sites if involved. This was another interesting paper that I came across. Uh, this was presented at the ASH, where they have actually 
uh, proposed a prognostic uh, score for uh, patients with BPDCN where the variables were age above 60 years, lymphadenopathy, presence of splenomegaly and bone marrow involvement. And uh, they have divided the score into uh, 0 to 2 for low, 3 to 4 for intermediate, and 5 to 8 for high. And the median overall survival for the high scorers was just 10 months. Patients who have age less than 60 years, who have normal cardiotypes and TDD positivity, they tend to have better outcomes. Older age and patients with African-American ethnicity tend to have poorer outcomes. So what about the role of stem cell transplantation in these patients? So here in this table, I've just summarized uh, what the various registry uh, data have been published in the past. So as per the EBMT registry, majority of the patients received a myeloablative conditioning for the transplantation. And the survival outcomes in patients uh, who were transplanted in the CR1 were almost, uh, uh, you know, 36% for the disease-free survival and 52% for the overall survival at three years. Uh, the Japanese registry has actually shown very good results, almost 70% uh, uh, of the patients having uh, good overall survival at four years. The North American also has shown uh, approximately 70 to 80% survival rates. And if the patients, I mean, this uh, here in this column, you can see the survival outcomes for all patients. So this includes uh, patients who have been transplanted in CR2. So OS rates are not that bad, uh, ranging between 40 to 50% considering the aggressive uh, disease that BPDCN is. And uh, this was a meta-analysis which was published in 2018 and they had shown uh, uh, OS rates of uh, ranging between 50 to 70 percent of the patients who underwent transplantation. For the autologous transplant, there are actually fewer case series and except for the Japanese registry, none of the other studies have actually shown very good outcomes for autologous. So uh, it is not yet, this, it is not the standard of care in majority of the patients. So it's just the allogenic transplant that needs to be done for uh, all the suitable cases. So what are the indications? So allogenic transplant should be done in all young and fit patients who are in CR1 and myeloablative conditioning is preferred over uh, reduced intensity. Whether there is a role of giving uh, Tagraxo first maintenance or not, that uh, certain trials are ongoing and we would have the results soon. For autologous transplant, the indications are extremely rare, uh, like patients who have chemosensitive uh, skin-only disease or extramedullary disease uh, who are in CR1 and are elderly, have comorbidities, no HLA match donor, for those patients, you may consider autologous transplants. But actually, there is no head-to-head -head trial uh, and, uh, you know, which are comparing the allogenic versus the autologous transplant or transplant versus the standard chemotherapy. So whatever data that I've shown is uh, through, you know, retrospective studies that have been published in the past. This was a paper which was uh, uh, published. Uh, actually, it was presented at the ASH and they have actually shown that in a group of 31 patients of BPDCN who underwent allergenic transplant, patients who were, uh, you know, the uh, transplant was done in the first CR, the survival outcomes, both the PFS and the OS was significantly better versus if they were transplanted in the relapsed diseases. So the idea is, the key point is that you need to transplant these patients in CR1 itself because second chance they will never actually get. So finally, finally, I come on to the novel agents, uh, which are there in uh, the field of BPDCN. And uh, just a cartoon to show the summary of these uh, agents. So we have certain CD123 targeted therapies, which are uh, either uh, bispecifics or CAR-T or antibody drug conjugates, as well as the Tagraxofus, which has been already been um, uh, you know FDA approved. Uh, certain CD56 uh, directed CAR-Ts as well then uh, many of these patients can have uh, FLIT3 mutations that I've already uh, shown earlier. So some of the FLIT3 inhibitors may be uh, effective in these patients um, because uh, there is uh, the incidence of uh, DNA, DNA methylation uh, mutations as well as epigenetic mutations. The use of HMAs is also extremely important in the treatment. Some of them can have IDH mutations, hence the use of IDH inhibitors. And of course, venetoclax, which has been a, you know, a modality of treatment for many diseases now because of the BCL2 inhibition. So um, the BPDCN cells, they have a host of surface markers, but the most uh, 
suitable and convenient marker that has been found through preclinical studies has been the CD123. And these are the host of all the agents that have been developed or are being developed and are in phase one or two trials for the treatment. But uh, at present, the only approved therapy that we have is uh, Tagraxofast, which is a recombinant protein. So just a table where, you know, the summary of all the CD123 targeted agents is there. What I want to highlight is the CAR T cell therapies are still in the phase one or two trials. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the relapsed uh, refractory settings, both AML and BPDCN. But then uh, in these trials, uh, there has been a very high rate of CRS. So the results as per what I have uh, reviewed the literature, they have not been very good. The ADC, uh, which is the pivacumab uh, sunirin, uh, this is basically um, antibody drug conjugate that has a DNA alkylating payload. This has been a very promising agent and is also in phase one or two trials in uh, BPDCN as well as other the CD123 positive hematologic malignancies. And the bispecific was the Vibicotamab, which was a bispecific CD123, CD3 antibody, but uh, it was uh, terminated uh, prematurely because of severe CRS. And the only approved FDA um, uh, approved therapy that we have for BPDCN is actually the Tagraxofast, which is mainly, uh, this, is, uh, this was uh, FDA approved in 2018, and this is a recombinant protein which has a catalytic domain and a translocation domain. And what happens is that in the catalytic uh, domain, there is a diphtheria toxin and this translocation domain actually binds to the IL-3 receptor. So CD123 is the alpha chain of the IL-3 receptor. It binds to it and it gets uh, endocytosed within the cytoplasm. This catalytic domain is released and then this binds to the elongation factor too. What happens is that it, uh, uh, it, there is an inactivation of the EF2 and hence the further protein synthesis, etc. is stopped and there is apoptosis of the cells. So this is briefly about the mechanism. And this was the pivotal phase one or two trial of Tagraxofas, which was uh, a multicentric trial. Uh, and here, um, mostly the patients, uh, most of them were untreated, uh, a couple of them were pre-treated as well. And they received the uh, doses of either 7 or 12 microgram per kg of Tagraxofast from day 1 to 5 of every 21-day cycle. And what they showed was the patients who were treatment naive, the overall survival rates were pretty good, almost 62%. <clears throat> at 12 months, uh, at 18 months, 59%. And the median OS was not reached with the median follow-up of 25 months. But in patients who were pre-treated, there were responses, but not as good as the patients who had been uh, a treatment naive. So this agent is given at a dosing of 12 microgram per kg intravenously over 15 minutes from day one to day five of a 21 day cycle. But the most important side effect that is seen with this agent is the capillary leak syndrome. And this uh, leads to hypotension, weight gain, edema, hemoconcentration in the patients. So there are clear cut guidelines and you know there are guides where like I have shown here, where you need to be sure that before starting the treatment, the patient has a baseline serum albumin of above 3.5 gram percent. The, uh, there should be no increase in the transaminases. The creatinine should not be greater than 1.8 and so on. There's a host of all, uh, you know, indicators which should be, you know, it's a, like a checklist. And once you're sure that these are all okay, and then only you start the treatment. If there is any derangement in these, then you need to hold the uh, tag and uh, supplement the patient with albumin or steroids and give supportive treatment. So now briefly about the pivacumab sunirin. So this is a antibody drug conjugate and this has a cytotoxic payload with it. And uh, uh, the results uh, of this agent were also recently presented. And this is basically the waterfall plot where you can see that both in the frontline setting, the dark blue are the frontline and the light blue are the relapse setting. In both of them, it has shown very good responses and there has been uh, you know, a significant decrease in the uh, bone marrow bl blast from the baseline once this agent was given and uh, this is also given um, as a IV injection uh, for uh, you know one day or, or of a 21 day cycle and uh, the important thing is that this agent does not cause capillary leak syndrome so that is a major advantage of this uh, particular therapy and it has been given a breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA because of the outstanding results.
coming on to veneto clax activity so this uh, agent um, has been like a magic bullet for multiple uh, hematologic malignancy so even in bpdcn it has shown very good responses here you can see this was the first a uh, paper which was uh, presented uh, which was published by Kono Pleva uh, she is also uh, from MD Anderson and uh, four weeks post treatment you, you know you can see that the skin lesions have healed completely in the patients and you know they have had uh, phenomenal responses but again uh, this is not going to work as a monotherapy so it has to be given in combination and uh, the majority of the work has been done by Naveen Pemaraju and his colleagues and they have combined uh, venetoclax with the both the hypomethylating agents especially in patients who are older unfit having multiple comorbidities and many of them have uh, you know had good responses and have been bridged to allergenic transplant Similarly, for the fit patients, they have done, uh, you know, combinations of enetoclax with hyper-CVAD and uh, many of them have achieved uh, good CR rates and ongoing trials are there where, uh, you know, the combination of venetoclax with the hyper-CVAD and tagraxofas are also ongoing. So this is the triple or the total therapy, which I just talked about. So this is in trial where they are giving a triple treatment with venetoclax, hyper -CVAN and TAG. So for the induction cycle one, what they give is the TAG Raxofas is given as a single agent. For the even cycles, they are giving TAG uh, from day one to five along with venetoclax for 14 days. And for the odd cycles, they are giving then uh, along with the hyper -CVAD. So that is given. And then this is uh, also, uh, you know, along with that, they are giving intrathecal chemotherapies for cycle 3, 5, and 7. And for the maintenance, they are giving the standard POM therapy along with the venetoclax uh, also. So this is under trial and the results should be available. So this is just a, a very uh, crowded uh, table, but I just want to highlight that whether you're giving an AML type therapy or an ALL th type therapy, the actual responses are not very different. But... Once you transplant these patients, the survival rates improve uh, significantly. And uh, here you can see that uh, in all these studies, where they, uh, these are all retrospective studies, but they have shown that with transplants, the uh, overall survival rates can be as high as uh, 60 to 70 percent, two year and four year overall survivals. And uh, here, uh, this was uh, the only study uh, by Naveen Pemaraju where they have used only targeted therapy, which is the TAG. Uh, which has been given as induction and the response rates have been as high as 75 percent and the uh, after transplant these patients have had uh, two-year overall survival rates of almost 60 to 70 percent just a word about bpdcn uh, in the pediatric and adult uh, the young adults uh, population so this was a very nice paper by uh, Branko Kuglivan, which was published uh, recently. And they have uh, done a literature review of total of around 70 cases where they found that, again, there is a male predominance and the uh, ages commonly seen are basically from 9 to 11. The most common presentation is of, of the skin followed by the lymph nodes, uh, sorry, the skin, the bone marrow, then the lymph nodes and the peripheral blood and the CNS. But what is important here is that <clears throat> the evolution of pediatric BPDCN is probably the uh, mechanisms are different uh, that has been postulated. And uh, the treatment should be ALL based, including the CNS prophylaxis. But for the pediatric population, they say that because they have much better response rates, the allergenic transplant is only reserved in the refractory or the relapsed uh, subsets. And uh, agents like venetoclax and tagraxofas have also been used in uh, these patients, especially if they have had a relapse. And there are, there are no definite prognostic factors for these patients. What about the future treatment approaches? So, uh, like I mentioned about the triplets, for young patients, the triplet of tag plus ven and hypercivad. For the older patients, uh, you know, com combining these two with the azacitidine. And also now we see that pivacimab is also, uh, there are trials which are studying its role in the front line because, you know, it is does not have the side effect of CLS. So uh, uh, definitely it would be quite advantageous over Tagraxo first because the dreaded complication would be, you know, it won't be seen with the pivacimab. And also whether, you know, after these triplet therapies, if there is any role of, you know, eliminating the stem cell transplant, if these patients become MRD negative. So even that is a future, uh, you know, uh, prospect that needs to be seen. <clears throat> For the relapsed refractory setting, 
we have again the triplets uh, the combination of menetoclax with desitabine and the post transplant uh, tigraxophus maintenance and the trials are ongoing uh, this is just a algorithm which i really liked uh, this was basically published in the cancer management uh, um, uh, journal and this was uh, by a chinese group and here you can see that for induction you know if the tigraxophus is available then that would be the standard order of care for majority of the patient otherwise an all based chemotherapy can be given after the induction therapy, you go on to doing the restaging and depending on your responses, you can further either continue and, uh, uh, you know, with the transplant or switch therapy and so on. So this is a useful uh, reference that can be uh, seen. We also have data from India. A number of case reports, both pediatric and adult BPDCN cases have been reported. And this was also an interesting uh, paper from the Rajiv Gandhi group where they have used daratumumab in combination with bortezomib uh, in an uh, elderly female who relapsed after uh, receiving venetoclax and azacitidine. So this is my final slide. So for conclusion, BPDCN is a difficult to diagnose uh, disease because of the overlap with other hematologic malignancies. But a high index of suspicion and early diagnosis is definitely very critical to proper management. In majority of the cases, we see that, uh, you know, the from the time of diagnosis to the treatment, you know, there is a gap of, uh, you know, six months because a patient uh, is... Uh, not able to get a proper diagnosis because of the lack of awareness. So definitely we need to be sensitized uh, for this particular disease, uh, especially the clinicians as well as the hematopathologist. And then IHC and a flow cytometry to uh, you know the, determine the positivity for the classic triad of BPDCN as well as the uh, specific markers is uh, uh, what is required. Current uh, chemotherapy regimens, uh, they are basically, uh, they don't have that much of durable responses. There, there are no clear-cut guidelines available, but definitely allogenic transplant remains beneficial in these uh, populations. Tagraxophus, if available, has definitely has revolutionized the management and additional targeted therapies are also under investigation like penetoclax. So I thank everyone for the kind attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Akanksha, for that wonderful and fantastic overview. Hats off to you for such a hard work you've done for creating these beautiful slides. A beautiful update, you covered almost everything. And even the last ASH 2023 also you picked up everything. Thank you so much for being with us. And now I request all of our discussions to please put the raise in signs so that we can start our question answer session with Dr. Akang Chagar. Yes, Dr. Deep Gala, your question, please. Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful overview. Actually, ma'am, I have one question. Uh, is there any difference in prognosis between patients who have cutaneous involvement and versus those who do not have cutaneous involvement? Yes. So actually, there is a paper, I didn't mention here because of the lack of time, but they've actually shown that even the skin only uh, BPDCN has got a poor overall survival. So actually, there's no not much difference in the outcome. So even if it's a skin only, you cannot just get away with giving localized treatment. They need to be given uh, intensive uh, treatments because they tend to, uh, you know, uh, the relapses are uh, quite high in these patients. And because of the aggressiveness of the disease, they can have ongoing CNS relapses also. So overall, the prognosis of uh, there is no difference in the outcomes or the prognosis of whether it's a skin only BPDCN or it's a combined or a systemic. So the treatment remains the same. There is no difference. Only in patients, you know, you are you cannot give intensive chemotherapy or, uh, you know, in those subset, you may consider giving only palliative therapy. But if the intention is to cure and treat, then you need to give the full-blown uh, therapy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Deep Gala. Dr. Sahitya, your question, please. Um, hi, ma'am. That was an extensive overview on a very rare disorder. Um, I know we all talk about Tegrisophus, uh, although it's not available in India. So my question to you is, what do you go to induction in young fit patients who are diagnosed with BPCDN? What is so, your comment? Yeah, so I've not come across a young patient with BPDCN. The only patient that I treated was uh, in his 60s. 
so i i gave uh, the B, bfm protocol to him so it is basically an all type of therapy but if possible then i, I would suggest if it's a young patient then you should go for an hyper cvad uh, regime because obviously tag is not available in india and even i think flag is a good uh, option flag ida in uh, some of the patients if they can tolerate but in majority of the centers i think if you are able to give at least a hyper cvad for the young fit patient then that's good enough thank you ma'am and uh, just to uh, off label this thing since when is coming into the picture uh, so if we in, indeed these patients go on to uh, receive an just uh... i think she got disconnected okay till she join so any other person want to ask anything any other discussions um, ma'am ma'am yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, please, ma'am. Uh, Akanksha, I just wanted to uh, again go back to your slide where you have shown the results, means uh, five year survival post transplant, yes. and uh, what happens when uh, when you defer in the pre transplant induction treatment. Like yes, the best was uh, with uh, with the lymphoma uh, treatment, and you yes. have a best uh, outcome. But at the last, you have returned that that was around 85% overall survival, five years. Yes, ma'am. And then the last targeted, it has shown only 66%. So uh, what do you prefer in that situation? Whether so, uh, ma'am, do you go for targeted or uh, lymphoma-like treatment followed by transplant? So, uh, ma'am, that was uh, the results that were... Uh, that you talked about was from the Japanese registry. So they have actually shown very good results, uh, even if they have given the ALL type therapy or the AML type therapy. And I think with this uh, NHL type therapy, they have given uh, much uh, better uh, uh, CR rates. But yeah, uh, yes, post transplant results are better with the NHL type. So even, even ALL, AML, and other types of. So, uh, but uh, because, you know, this is, uh, this has to be treated with an intensive therapy. So, they have not actually mentioned what therapy uh, they have given for the NHLs. So, mm -hmm. I don't think with the CHOP or the CHOP, they would have, uh, you know, had such good overall survival rates. But the, um, I feel that the standard of treatment should be an ALL-based uh, therapy in most of the patients. Because if you are planning to give a lymphoma type of therapy, it will not be for a long duration and it won't be that intensive. Unless if you are planning to give something like DA epoch or so on. But most of the patients don't tolerate that because uh, they are elderly having comorbidities. So mm -hmm. if uh, I think I would suggest that if it's an elderly patient with many comorbidities, you uh, you can give uh, HMA with venetoclax in those patients. And if it's a younger patient, it is better to give an ALL type of uh, treatment along with CNS prophylaxis. With the elderly, the problem would be that you can't give uh, uh, the uh, the BFM also is not tolerated uh, by most of the elderly patients. So if you can give a venetoclax with an HMA, then that would be a good option. Yes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Saiti, you were locked out, actually. You can repeat your question. Yes, sir, sorry. Uh, that was a, a minor disconnection from my side. Ma'am, only uh, thing I wanted to ask is if they do indeed go for a transplant, uh, can we give, because we can't uh, give a uh, tegrazofast maintenance, can we give an off-label uh, ventoclax maintenance or an azacitidine maintenance because they're very high risk for it? Yes, I think that's a, a good idea because, you know, these patients, even post-transplant, uh, if you can... Uh, like you give for your AMLs, you can continue giving uh, uh, either as a citidine or a venetoclax uh, to these patients because tagraxophus per, per se is uh, not available and uh, its role in post-transplant maintenance is also under trial. We don't have results. But if you have a real, uh, uh, real world uh, patient who has undergone a transplant, then definitely giving a post-transplant maintenance would be a good idea. The agent, whether an HMA or a venetoclax is up to you or whatever treatment he has responded to prior to the transplant, maybe accordingly you can choose. But it's a good idea to give maintenance. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Saitya. Any other discussion you want to ask? Any question? Dr. Anup? 
Uh, hi, yeah, not a question, just a comment. Just look, I, first of all, this was mostly Greek and Latin to me. I have yet to see a case, uh, but very, very informative lecture. Thank you. Just uh, going back to the transplant outcomes, like this, just a comment. Um, uh, I do transplants, but if you see the outcome, I know Japanese data was very promising, but more, like in most orphan diseases, the rest of the world have not been able to reproduce that. So if you look at the just the first row in that slide, that is the EBMT data, I've seen that the median age was some, something like 41, uh, which meant that about 70% received myeloablative conditioning and the three-year DFS was uh, dismal around 33% or something like that. So my feeling is that probably in this disease, as more data evolves, transplant may not be the option, go-to option. It might probably be metronomic, some immunotherapic uh, treatment, yeah, especially when you see a patient who is uh, older than 60. Just a comment. Yes, sir. so what they're, uh, actually there are, I mean, they have raised, I, I mentioned about the, you know, a future ongoing trial. So they are seeing the results of, you know, a, either the triple combination of tagraxofas with venetoclax and as a citadine and you know if uh, all anyways the mrd is not yet standardized for this disease but we if we are able to prove that the patient has achieved an mrd and uh, has got a morphologic cr then these patients can be just uh, you know especially because most of them are elderly so you may just continue them on these uh, treatments uh, if it's feasible and affordable and uh, you know and we can just maybe omit uh, or eliminate the uh, role of transplant in these patients because of the fact that in the long term outcomes are not as good as 80 or 90 percent so maybe sure. just giving the targeted treatment to, to these patients would be a good idea or if post transplant you can give the uh, tagraxo first that also may help in improving the overall survival because in these cases they did not receive any maintenance that's that's what I, uh, you know, when I reviewed the literature, I found that no maintenance was as such given to these patients. So that's what. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, from 48803. Uh, I'm Dr. Hita. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akanksha. That was a very nice talk. Uh, ma'am, I have two questions. One uh, is like uh, for choosing between like AML based uh, ML like chemotherapy or ALL like induction regimens. Uh, do the IHC markers or the flow cytometry markers have any role in choosing the therapy? Then that's my first question. And the second question is like, is PET mandatory or optional or what is the take on doing a PET scan? So I would answer, thanks for the questions. Uh, so I would answer the second question first. So PET uh, is not mandatory because uh, this disease, you know, there's no staging for it. So there's no defined staging for BPDCN. It is just that, you know, if the patient, you feel that he's got lymph nodes and uh, there are certain extramedullary uh, aspects to the disease, then you may just do it for, you know, follow up and for the response assessment. So at a baseline, if you can just get a CT scan done, uh, for this patient, then, you know, you can just follow it up uh, later on to uh, just uh, find out how uh, much reduction in the size of the nodes has occurred. But it's not a mandatory um, uh, investigation at baseline. And secondly, for the first uh, question that you asked me, that was regarding how to choose between the AML or ALN treatments depending on the flow. So, I don't think that, uh, you know, depending on if there are certain, uh, see, if it's a BPDCN, uh, then you need to be sure that, you know, you are not dealing with a PDC AML. So that has a different uh, thing. So if you have CD34 positivity, then you are more likely to be dealing with the AML. So in those uh, cases, definitely an AML kind of therapy can be given, but again, the outcomes will be dismal. The main aspect here is the CD123. So if the 123 is positive, then although we don't have targeted treatment, but even those patients can be uh, uh, treated with uh, these agents to have a better outcome. But as such, deciding on the basis of flow cytometry, whether you know it has a, uh, the a, a T marker or uh, the myeloid marker that does not dictate for BPDCN alone. So you need to differentiate whether it's a BPDCN with a concomitant malignancy, then it will be different. So if it's an ALL, but there are certain markers of, uh, you know, the BPDCN, then you would go uh, and treat um, like uh, an ALL. But in AML, you need to differentiate whether it's a PDC AML or a BPDCN with an AML. 
so i think the flow really makes a lot of uh, difference in those cases but as such i think uh, because of the cns uh, involvement which is very commonly seen in the bpdcn all type of therapies preferred okay but if you get a pdc aml then in that case you have to give a aml kind of therapy so you have to be very sure that you know it is either it's just the bpdcn or it's a uh, you know a, a mature uh, uh, plasma cytokine dendritic cell proliferation which is seen along with the uh, aml or a cmml and so on okay thank you thank you thank you for the answer thank you ma'am to takanksha from the same note this year ash they had a presentation on aml on ntcg 123 and yes. they also showed this progress of us doing well as well as car t cell the ntcg 123 car t cell therapy yes so is there any headway com comparison between this ntcg 120 progress of us versus ntcg 120 car t cell therapy followed by straight away allogeneic stem cell transplant in a case of bpdc uh i i'm sorry i'm not aware of any such uh, trial if that there has been a head to head or a randomized control trial i have not come across okay so i think they have presented this in for aml acute myeloid leukemia but, but for bpdc and i'm not sure yeah the whatever i searched i couldn't find any in fact the cd123 i don't think it has been that popular for bpdc and because of the high incidence of crs i mean whatever the although it was a lentiviral car t only but they have probably uh, you know they have not been able to get good results because of the high incidence of crs thank you so any other discussions want to ask any other question to dr akanksha agar well so just a minute there are some questions coming up in the audience just uh, yes we have one question from dr priya darshini young patient with bpdcn if he relapses with hyper severe plus venetic lex what are the other options left in relapse setting other than tagras of us and car t cell therapy yes <laughs> in an in indian setting i think um, after uh, actually when the patients relapse you can still uh, you know uh, in these patients you can rechallenge with the other type of therapy like you can give an aml kind of therapy or a flag you know for chemotherapy based uh, treatment has to be planned and uh, uh, also i would like to highlight that patients uh, who have previously re uh, received a uh, tigraxofus treatment they tend to there is no loss of the cd123 so it is still a targetable uh, marker that you know for which you can use uh, treatment but uh, if you are talking about just chemotherapy and venetoclax and hepc where the patient has relapsed then you can probably uh, go for a aml type of treatment and see even i think flag would be a good option Uh, also, sometimes people uh, people have also used uh, bendamustine, bortezomib in these patients because there is an involvement of NFK beta pathway, and uh, uh, sometimes even if uh, CD thirty eight is positive, like I showed in one of the case reports, they have actually used daratumumab also for the patient. So yes, I mean there's no clear cut um, answer to you know these uh, cases because it's a rare disease and there have not have been. many uh, studies and uh, you know case reports for this particular uh, entity but um, yes i mean you can just you know change the type of treatment and see from all to an aml based treatment and so on thank you and another question is that in how many percent of cases can be bpdc and can be without skin manifestations so around one third i think patients can be Uh, they can present with just uh, 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 the sorry without skin manifestation it be it would be very less i think less than 2 to 3% systemic only systemic presentation of bpdcn can also be seen but uh, um, that is extremely rare i would say less than 2 uh, to 3% with just systemic presentation and no skin presentation but they do happen they have been reported so is there any difference of prognosis between those who present as skin manifestation and those who do not have skin manifestation so that's what i uh, the first question what dr deep asked me so actually there is no difference uh, uh, the prognosis remains the same if it's uh, any kind of presentation the prognosis uh, 
uh, is uh, going to be the is going to be worse so if it's a skin like or only skin also then still you should be giving an intensive chemotherapy if the patient uh, has the uh, you know the performance status and no com comorbidities are present then it, you should always uh, you know uh, plan to give an intensive chemotherapy a non intensive therapy would definitely have poorer outcomes as compared to an intensive chemotherapy thank you so any other discussions want to ask any other question well so there are no more raising signs and there are no more questions from the audience for takaksha you were superb fantastic awesome what a wonderful lecture and what a wonderful journey of this rare disease bpdcn and what a wonderful question association thank you so much for updating us on this rare entity bpdcn and what a wonderful knowledge you have fantastic awesome hats off to you thank you so much once again for being with us i thank all the discussants as well as audience to join today saturday evening for us and tomorrow sharp at sunday 11:30 am morning we have another beautiful lecture on mds please join with us tomorrow that is sunday 31st of december thank you so much once again wish you a very very happy new year well in advance to all of you thank you so much once again thank you dr akaksha thank you all the audience and thank you all the discussants goodbye for now